Welcome to Celestial Chronicles, where we delve into the mysteries of the divine and the prophetic. Today, we're exploring the Book of Revelation, a text that has captivated and intrigued for centuries. Have you ever wondered what the end times might look like? Join us as we journey through visions of the apocalypse, promises of a new kingdom, and the ultimate battle between good and evil. Are you ready to uncover the secrets held within this ancient scripture? Let's begin. The Book of Revelation encapsulates the apocalyptic aspirations of the early Christian community in their most vivid and comprehensive form. The concept of apocalypticism was not novel to Christians, it was a deeply ingrained belief among Jews. They believed that the advent of God's kingdom would not occur through a slow transformation, but rather through a sudden divine intervention. This intervention would mark the end of the current age and the establishment of God's kingdom in a renewed world. This vision of future events is tied to the belief that before this time arrives, the battle between good and evil will intensify. As the forces of evil gain strength, they will persecute and, in some cases, even cause the death of those who choose the path of righteousness. This conflict will ultimately reach a peak, at which point God will step in, annihilate the forces of evil, and establish a new order where the righteous will dwell eternally. The emergence of the Messiah will align with the unfolding of these events. When the Christian community acknowledged their faith in Jesus, the Crucified One, as the anticipated Messiah, it necessitated a re-evaluation of their understanding of Jesus' mission and particularly the manner in which his mission would be fulfilled. Their conviction that the Messiah's work must culminate in victory and glory led them to believe that this culmination could only be achieved through Jesus' return to earth from the heaven where he had ascended. This second advent, coinciding with the unfolding of all events associated with the apocalyptic plan, will mark the onset of the new age and the ultimate eradication of all evil forces. As the years rolled on, a growing number of Christians, particularly those enduring persecution under the Roman government, became increasingly anxious about the timeline of these prophesied events. By the close of the first Christian century, the practice of emperor worship had become widely accepted, not just in Rome, but also in the peripheral territories of the empire. Christians who declined to worship the emperor were charged with a variety of crimes and faced harsh punishments. Some chose martyrdom over renouncing their faith. This was a pivotal period for the Christian movement as a whole, with many of its followers questioning if the persecution would ever cease, while others were uncertain about the path they should take. Some were even tempted to forsake their faith or make enough compromises with Rome to preserve their lives. In this challenging environment, a Christian named John penned the Book of Revelation, addressing it to the seven churches located in Asia Minor. The book's objective was to fortify the faith of these church members by assuring them that their deliverance from the malevolent forces confronting them was imminent. John was certain that the monumental day of divine intervention would transpire in a relatively short span of time. However, in line with the apocalyptic literature that Jewish Christians were acquainted with, he was aware that numerous frightening events would precede it. He sought to alert his fellow Christians about these impending events, thereby preparing them for a time when their faith would undergo a more rigorous trial than anything they had previously encountered. In writing Revelation, John follows the pattern that was used in older apocalyptic writings in the Old Testament, such as the Book of Daniel in the Old Testament, 1 Esdras in the Apocrypha, the Book of Enoch in the Pseudepigrapha, the Assumption of Moses, and many other well-known writings, including sections of the Book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament and portions of the Synoptic Gospels. In all of these writings, events appear as though they were predicted long before they actually took place. The revelations are usually through dreams or visions in which coming events are symbolized by strange figures, the meanings of which are sometimes disclosed by an angelic messenger who was sent for that particular purpose. The apocalypses were produced in times of crises, and they were written for the benefit of people who were suffering hardship and privation at the particular time when the writing was done. At the outset of Revelation, John recounts his experience on the Isle of Patmos, where he was exiled due to his religious beliefs. He heard a resonant voice instructing him to document his visions and dispatch the writings to the seven churches in Asia. This voice belonged to Jesus Christ, who had resurrected and ascended to heaven. Christ's messages are directed to seven angels, each serving as a guardian for a specific church, Ephesus, Smyrna, Thyatira, Pergamum, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Christ praises these churches for their virtuous deeds, but for five of them, he also delivers a message of caution and rebuke. He is particularly critical of those who accept the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, whose teachings he perceives as a significant threat to the Christian community because they endorse the consumption of meat sourced from animals sacrificed to idols. 
While the Apostle Paul and other Christians argued that this practice was not of crucial significance and that individuals should be allowed to follow their own consciences, John evidently did not agree with this perspective. In his view, the essential test for all Christians, as it is for Jews, is strict adherence to all laws, and the regulations related to prohibited food are no exception. Even though it may seem relatively insignificant, people's attitudes toward such matters reflect how they will act in more serious situations. Christ praises those churches whose members have withstood persecution and, in some cases, even death rather than pledge their loyalty to Roman leaders, who asserted their own godliness and demanded worship alongside the empire's other deities. He identifies Pergamum as the dwelling place of Satan, given that the practice of emperor worship was particularly prevalent there. Christ cautions Christians to brace themselves for even harsher persecutions in the near future. However, they are urged to stay steadfast and view these trials as tests of their moral fiber. Those who maintain their loyalty will be rescued from their adversaries, and in the soon-to-be-established new order, they will be bestowed with a crown of life and the guarantee of the new order's eternal existence. The current persecutions will be short-lived, as the time of God's judgment is imminent. After delivering his messages to the seven churches, John proceeds to depict the seven seals, scrolls inscribed with a narrative of the imminent events. The resurrected Christ, also known as the Lamb of God, is deemed the only one worthy of unsealing these scrolls. Upon the opening of the first seal, a white horse materializes, its rider set out to conquer. As more seals are unveiled, three additional horses, one red, one black, and one pale, swiftly follow. These four horses and their riders symbolize the conflicts that will herald the ultimate downfall of the Roman Empire. When the fifth seal is opened, John is granted a glimpse of the souls of those who, amidst their suffering, cry out, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? They are informed that the forces of destruction are on the verge of being unleashed upon the world, and they may have to endure even more severe trials. However, if they remain steadfast through it all, they will be counted among the redeemed, their names inscribed in the Book of Life. Following John's vision of the impending disasters soon to be inflicted upon the world, the scene changes, and four angels representing the four winds of heaven are told to hold back these winds until the servants of God have had seals placed on their foreheads. John then reveals the number of those who are sealed. Drawing an analogy between the twelve tribes of ancient Israel and the Christian community regarded now as the new Israel, he gives the number of 144,000, or 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel. Before the opening of the seals is completed, another series of disasters is revealed in the appearance of seven angels, each one carrying a trumpet. The blowing of these trumpets announces such physical catastrophes as the coming of a great earthquake, the turning of rivers into blood, and the darkening of the sun and the moon, as well as the falling of the stars from heaven. After these physical phenomena, which will indeed be appalling, the wrath of God will be visited more directly upon those who persecute members of the Christian community. Before describing the manner of this visitation, John identifies the power now vested in the Roman Emperor with an evil being, who, through the centuries, has been at war against the forces of righteousness. This evil being is none other than Satan, the archenemy of God, who is now putting forth a supreme effort to destroy the righteous from the face of the earth. He is the dragon who launched a rebellion against God. John tells us that, there was war in heaven, as Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. The result of the conflict was that the dragon was cast out of heaven and one-third of the angels were cast out with him. This same dragon worked through King Herod in an attempt to destroy the Christ child as soon as he was born. His work has continued ever since, and according to John, he is now trying to accomplish his purpose by working through the Roman Emperor. His evil character is manifest in the cruel persecutions that are being inflicted upon Christians. In his depiction of this power that seems to be gaining control over the world, John employs imagery from the book of Daniel, which describes a malevolent ruler who attempted to subjugate the Jews. The author of the book of Daniel symbolizes this ruler as a formidable and fearsome beast with seven heads and ten horns. Similarly, John uses a beast to symbolize the Roman emperor, whose likeness was imprinted on the empire's coins. At one juncture, John explicitly identifies the entity symbolized by the beast, stating, this requires wisdom. If anyone has understanding, let him compute the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. While John appears to be referring to the Roman emperor, he is also personifying the forces of evil. His condemnation of the emperor stems from his belief that Satan is embodied in the actions of the empire, as he perceives Satan and the empire to be collaborating towards a shared objective. As John perceives the end approaching, he portrays the angels of heaven voicing their cries aloud. Three angels materialize, the first proclaiming the arrival of God's judgment hour, 
the second declaring the fall of Babylon, symbolizing Rome, and the third outlining the dreadful destiny of those who venerate the beast or its image. As a final retribution, these false worshippers are cast into a lake of fire, where they will be eternally annihilated. Subsequently, seven additional angels emerge, each bearing a bowl filled with what symbolizes the impending wrath of God, set to be unleashed in the form of the seven final plagues. These plagues will afflict the wicked of John's era, mirroring the series of plagues that plagued the ancient Egyptians before the Israelites were liberated from their enslavement. When the first angel empties his bowl onto the earth, repugnant and malevolent sores sprout on the men who bear the mark of the beast and worship its image. When the second angel pours out his bowl onto the sea, the sea morphs into blood, resulting in the death of all living creatures within it. Disasters of a similar nature ensue as the remaining angels discharge their bowls. The monumental cataclysmic events that signal the termination of all earthly kingdoms will also mark the return of Christ, descending from the heavens. As Christ nears the earth, the wicked will be vanquished by the radiance of his arrival. For a millennium, Satan will be restrained, leaving the earth in desolation. During this period, the righteous will find sanctuary in the city of God, the New Jerusalem. At the conclusion of the thousand years, the city of God will descend to earth. The wicked will then be resurrected, and after a futile attempt to overthrow the city of God, they will meet their end in what John refers to as the second death. The final chapters of Revelation offer a radiant portrayal of the New Jerusalem, with its golden streets, jasper walls, pearl gates, and the river of life flowing perpetually from God's throne. In this celestial dwelling, sorrow and crying will be absent, for God will erase all tears, and death will be no more. As we close this chapter on the book of Revelation, we're left to ponder the profound messages it conveys. What does the promise of a new Jerusalem mean to you? Imagine a world free from sorrow, where life flows eternal. This is the hope that has sustained believers through trials and tribulations. But the question remains, how close are we to witnessing the dawn of this new age? Share your thoughts and join the conversation below. Remember, the journey through the Celestial Chronicles continues. Until next time, keep looking up.